okay, every six minutes, someone looks at their phone, right? That's what we just found out. This is going to go on for 20 minutes. So I ch just try not to look at your phones for, what, 20 minutes. I don't know if you can handle that. Okay, I'm going to talk about the intersection of data and science and what we're doing at Expedia. Now, the truth of the matter is, it's about two slides. It's at the end of this presentation. The majority of this presentation is about the journey that we took, that I took, to find this epiphany moment of this intersection of data and creativity. And I think the journey itself is interesting, something that hopefully you all can relate to in, in your field of work. And like any journey, it's nonlinear. Random events come together, and then years later, the light bulb goes off, and you figure it out. And that's what happened to me. So it's 2016, and the president of Expedia comes to me and says, we need a new marketing campaign. We need to inspire a whole new generation of, of, of travelers, or would-be travelers. So I did what any researcher would do, what you would do, which is let's find out who our customers are, what are they interested in, let's find out about the category. But I was also very curious, because I'm a marketer at heart, I'm an advertiser at heart, how do we make great advertising? So I looked at 72 of the best ads in the world, from the US, from Europe, from Asia, ads in Japanese, ads in German, ads in Italian, ads in Spanish. And we codified every single one to see if there were some themes that were bubbling up. And there was. It was quite interesting. So I'm going to play for you a, a reel. It's a really short reel. It's only four ads. It's not all 72. If you want to see 72, I can share them with you. Um, it's four ads. You, you may have seen these. They stretch over a decade. Sorry, they stretch over decades. Some may be familiar. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. Yeah, just a typical Super Bowl car ad, right? Or a hilarious beer ad. <laughs> or whatever ad this is. Whatever. But it's a Tide ad. What? It's a Tide ad. What makes it a Tide ad? There are no stains. But yo, right now, kick the bass for them brothers and let them know what goes on. Rolling stones of the raptor, not bragging. Look bigger than Jagger, not sagging. Sprawl it backwards, I'm gonna leave it at that. Just a quick sample of ads that have stretched across decades. They've scored best in their category when they were on air. And there was a theme. Make people laugh, make people cry, wrap it in an interesting story, make it memorable, and you roughly have the recipe for what constituted all of those ads to be best in class. So January 20th, 2016, we put that together at Expedia and we aired what we thought was best in class for us using that recipe for success. It's an important question you ask, but one I think with a simple answer. We have this need, you and I, from the time we were little, to peek over our neighbor's fence. And once we do, we see there's wonder waiting on the other side. Every step you take brings the world one step closer. You'll narrow the influence of narrow minds. You'll bridge continents, puncture prejudice, and keep peace. You may not always know it at the time, but one day you will look back and see that you've made this world a better place. 
So, the question you asked me, what is the key? It's you. What do you think? Yes, that was, that was a round of, I'm gonna move this because it is actually what I need to know what I'm doing. Um, we got that same applause internally. Round of high fives, my team was super excited, the management team was excited, the board was excited. This is great. But at Expedia, we wanna want measure everything, so we wanna measure how, how good were we? How do we do? And so what we do is we, um, we have a simple survey. It's one question that we ask. What, were you, would you be interested in booking with Expedia? We ask that question. We then show them our work, and we ask that question again. And we're looking at the delta. So would you be interested in booking with Expedia? Three out of five. We ask the question again after they see the commercial. Now, how likely would, it, how likely would you book with Expedia? 3.5. The delta, 0.5, is what we codify. And this is codification of every single ad that we've tested. Here's train. The score next to it is zero. We were so wrong. How could we be that wrong? We thought it was the best ad we ever produced. It was one of the worst ads. We dug in a little bit further to find out more on what went wrong. Here's a chart. Uh, it's, it's facial coding recognition that looks at second by second what people think about the ads when they're watching the commercial. Um, and, what we've, and the blue line is males, the, the pink line is females, and it's a measure of confusion. Um, males were more confused than females. I think that's generally the case. Okay. <laughs> Advertising aside, generally the case, but there were certain spots, certain frames within this commercial where we really lost the female audience. Uh, the guns came out, there was a protest scene, there was a, a few other scenes, and, and, and things weren't working, and we, we, we ignored it, we missed it. And I think we missed it because what was talked about earlier in, in, in the setup, the confirmation bias, the researcher bias. I'm a traveler, you're all travelers, I put myself into this work. I put my political views, my, my views of, of life, of travel, into the advertising, and that showed it's why certain scenes didn't resonate with, with certain audiences. So I really wanted to dig in a little bit further, and this is where my nonlinear random events journey began. You need to understand what, what we did so wrong. So let's start with that journey. I'm an avid reader. Um, after the US elections, I, I picked up a book by uh, a, a political researcher. Um, his name is John Hibbings, and, and he wrote this book called Predisposed. And he talked a lot about how the US elections and, and how they turned out the way they turned out. Um, and while there was a, a lot of talk about liberal views versus conservative views, and that may have affected many people, he actually said a lot of it had to do, some of it had to do with biology. And he used science to decipher why consumers voted the way they voted. Now, instead of me trying to explain it to you, I'm going to let John explain it to you. So here's a clip. Um, it's, a, it's from a talk show that he was on with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's an astrophysicist doing a talk show. But let's go with it. All right. So uh, I missed that, right? So nonlinear event. Register, I registered this event, which is our biology predisposes us to looking at pieces of film or anything and having a react, have a different reaction to it. So that's interesting. I took that moment away and I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna remember that. Let's see what happens. I, I live in London um, and my commute to the office is about 27 minutes. And that is just enough time to get in a full um, audio file, a, a, a podcast. So I listen to podcasts. I try to get one podcast in a day. Um, and so I'm gonna share with you uh, lesson two, which I gleaned from listening to a podcast. Now, it's about four minutes long. It's audio only. <laughs> um, so let's see if I don't lose the crowd here. So it's audio only. It's a podcast. But I think you'll, you'll find a nice gem at the end of this, hopefully. So if you could focus. Tim Harford is the author of Messy, The Power of Disorder to Transform Our Lives. He joined us recently for a live taping just blocks from the White House at NPR's Weekend in Washington. It's an annual event that brings together public radio fans and supporters. Tim Harford, welcome to Hidden Brain. Thank you very much, Shankar. I want to begin by playing you a piece of music, Tim. How did that piece of music come about? What's the story? It's beautiful, isn't it? 
I mean, my, two of my children were born to that. It was played by Keith Jarrett, a great jazz pianist, uh, in 1975 in Cologne. And if you had been there two or three hours before the concert, you would not have expected things to go well. Keith Jarrett had just refused to play. And the reason he'd refused to play is because he had arrived on stage, met the piano. He was supposed to be he's completely improvised, by the way. The whole thing was going to be improvised. Met this piano and realized that there'd been a mistake. And the thing was literally unplayable. It was out of tune. Black keys were sticking. The pedals didn't work. The, uh, the upper register of the keyboard was, was harsh and tinny because all the felt had worn away. Um, and most importantly, it was too small. So it didn't have enough volume to actually reach the back of the Cologne Auditorium. And so, of course, he refused to play. And the organizer of the concert, who was this young German girl, she's just 17 years old, desperately tried to fix the piano, to replace the piano. She managed to get it somewhat in tune, but basically she couldn't really improve on it, and she couldn't get it replaced. And so the only option she had was to beg Keith Jarrett to play. And of course, he saw this teenager thought of the 1,400 people who were about to show up and listen to the concert, and said to her, never forget, only for you. And he went on stage, and he and his producer recorded the concert because they wanted documentary evidence of what a musical catastrophe sounds like <laughs> so they could play it to future promoters to tell them to do a good job and get a proper piano. But in fact, it's a masterpiece. Uh, it's Keith Jarrett's most popular Work. In fact, it's the most, uh, the best-selling jazz uh, album in history, solo jazz album in history, and the best-selling piano album in history. It's the Cologne Concert. And the surprising thing is that all the adjustments that Jarrett had to make to cope with this bad piano made the music better. So he avoided the harsh upper registers. He stuck to the middle of the keyboard. That makes it sound very soothing. But he also had to compensate for the fact that the piano was so quiet. So he had these rolling repetitive riffs in the bass to try to get some resonance. And he also just stood up and pounded down on the keys. So you can hear him moaning in, in frustration during the concert. He's hating it, but it is amazing. Uh, and that combination of, the, of the, the, the peacefulness and the dynamism makes this electrifying piece of music. So he did not expect that a bad piano would produce a great concert, but in fact it did. And the argument in my book is very often we're faced with the unplayable piano and actually we produce something great out of it. And that last bit was the lesson that I learned, which is constraints can breed creativity. When you're constrained, you can actually find freedom in that work. So I took that as, as my second lesson. Um, and lesson number three, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, play another audio file. I, I don't know how that worked over here. But I will tell you about uh, a book that, that I read. It's a Steve Jobs book. Um, and there's a passage in that book which, which stuck with me. I read this book many, many years ago, but, but, I, but I still noted it down. Creativity, this is him describing creativity. Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they, do, how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seemed obvious to them after a while. That's because they were able to connect experiences they've had and synthesize new things. So the idea of creativity is about putting experiences together and that, for me, was the missing piece in my formula. Emotion, make people laugh, people make people cry, wrapping in a story, important, having something memorable, important, but experience was part of the formula that I had forgotten. So we went off and I looked at now some more work with new eyes. And here is a short reel of what I think is best in class using that new formula where experience is at the core.
Okay, that was a longer reel because I have a lot of favorites. They all, stu <laughs> they all stuck to that formula though, right? Which is make you laugh, make you cry, interesting, put it into an interesting story, make it memorable, but also show the experience, live the experience, have the product be part of the story. So the lessons, let's just recap. I learned that we are wired differently um, and, and that matters and researcher bias is something that we need to be thinking about as we are Oops, as we are uh, building uh, marketing campaigns, um, I learned that creativity, constraints breed creativity, which was interesting, and I took that away. Uh, and I also learned that um, connecting with experiences really makes for memorable, interesting work. So now, back to the Expedia story. What are we doing at Expedia? Well, we use facial recognition, we use biometric data, we use information to help build better communications. We also added uh, constraints to our marketing campaigns. So here, what you're seeing here is a template. We have a global template that we use everywhere in the world and every frame was brought together and, and tested to ensure that this template works. And what we can do here through biometric data, through rigorous testing, is understand how to build each frame within this work. We test it frame by frame and we are able to put in different elements within our marketing message. Whether it's in Japanese, whether it's in Italian, or whether it's in English, this, frame, this framework is used globally digitally as well as on TV. So here's a quick sample of the work. Take off for Hawaii with Expedia. When you book your flight and add an activity, you can save over 30%. everything you need to go. Expedia. When she saw her favorite animals, all in real life, her face just lit up. And when I saw that, well, mine did too. When you book a flight with Expedia and at a hotel or activity, you can save. Everything you need to go. Expedia. If you could escape to your favorite beach, what would you do? Expedia has the most beach vacation options all in one place. So how did we do? Same survey, would you consider using Expedia? We asked people before the, before the ad, showed them the ad, we asked them again. We're looking at the delta in their response. New work outperforms all the prior work. We now have a rule at Expedia, we will not air any new commercial unless it beats the prior commercial. And we use our template in order to understand what's working, what's not working, and we use biometric data and neurosciences to build better campaigns. We call this approach led by creative, because creative is at its core, confirmed by science, and that is the intersection between data and science at Expedia.